Lin-Manuel Miranda has revolutionized what we think of Broadway musicals. He's made them part of the mainstream culture, and he's done it largely by being just really good at it. But when I say that, most people think of Hamilton as being the revolutionary musical, when in fact the revolution truly began with In the Heights. Granted, there have always been revolutionary works that challenge existing paradigms of how musicals should sound, but what In the Heights did was successfully challenge the paradigm. It won Best Musical, it launched Lin-Manuel Miranda, and it put stories of Latin Americans on stage to the point where it has opened doors for so many artists and people in its wake, including setting the stage for Hamilton. At the end of my third video on how rap works in Hamilton, I called Lin a synthesizer. No, not that kind of synthesizer. I mean, he is a person who's able to uniquely synthesize, as was his genius, synthesize. The musical theater tradition with the genre of vernacular music known as hip-hop or rap. I even made a three-part video series about that, check it out. One reason he can synthesize is that he has the ability as a composer to code switch, almost like he can talk respectfully to his elders and then turn around and crack a joke with the cool kids. And it's the quick, seamless toggling back and forth between these two worlds that gives In the Heights its revolutionary quality. I think the quote that sums up what Lynn was trying to achieve is... What, what's really exciting is, uh, you know, you get we get 80-year-old grandmas who say, I hate rap music, but I love this. I love this quote because to me, I see Lin-Manuel Miranda at his proudest. He wants to share his love of this music with the world. And what more prized audience is there than our beloved grandmothers? Statistically, they are a huge chunk of the Broadway ticket-buying audience. According to the Broadway League, in the 2018 to 2019 season, 68% of Broadway show attendees identified as women, and the single biggest age demographic of Broadway attendees was 50 to 64 year olds at 23.6%, and people older than 65 were no slouch either at 15.6%. So you might say that appealing to older women might be the recipe for a hit show. Hey, you might even want to write a show where a grandmother is a pivotal character, such as... In the Heights. That's right. Abuela, or Grandma, Claudia, may not be Usnavi's real grandmother, but he says she practically raised him. Now, she's one of the first characters introduced in the first three minutes of the show, which is what we're talking about today. And we're going to break down how skillfully Lin synthesizes his entire vision of Broadway in just the first three minutes of In the Heights. That's right, the DNA of Lin's synthesis is laid out even before the first chorus of the opening number. Keep in mind, I'm talking here about the stage version. The film is a whole different story and we're going to talk about that in upcoming videos. But for now, here we go. This is how Lin revolutionized Broadway in three minutes. Now it's sort of unfair to expect that in three minutes you're going to be able to merge Broadway tradition with a hip-hop aesthetic, not to mention authentically represent Dominican Republic and Puerto Rican culture, which we will eventually get to. But I think in three minutes that's exactly what Lin did. And I think one of the reasons he did that is because he knows how important the opening numbers are to establish the tone and overall aesthetic of a show. He knows that an opening can make or break a hit, which is exactly what happened with Stephen Sondheim's A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum, which went from a flop to a hit, all because it went from the wrong opening number to the right one, Comedy Tonight. Comedy Tonight! Sondheim says that his mentor, Oscar Hammerstein, once claimed, if the opening of a musical was the right one, the performers could read from a telephone directory for half an hour and the audience would still have a good time. And having the right opening number is even more crucial in an original story like in The Heights, where there's no built-in audience or familiarity. What we're doing, it is original, as opposed to taking a story that we know people already relate to. We are really starting from the ground up. Lynn starts off the show by getting rid of the standard overture. Barry K. Aloha created a series of Anatomy of a Musical diagrams that went viral, and in the section on Lin-Manuel Miranda, Barry noted that Lin uses almost no intro. Now typically musicals do have an intro piece called an overture, a piece of music played by the orchestra which introduces all of the main melodies that the audience will be hearing in the course of the show. Some overtures have even become lauded as pieces in their own right, such as Leonard Bernstein's Candide Overture, which is often played as a standalone concert piece. But even so, the idea is that the audience is supposed to listen to this thing for five minutes or so while scrambling to their seats, wrapping up their conversations, and just sort of enjoying the anticipation. Lynn doesn't do that. He gets right to it. The curtain opens 
on a Washington Heights street corner at the break of dawn. And though we hear music, it is not from an orchestra, but it's canned. Instead of an orchestra, we hear radio station channel surfing. Now, Lynn said that one of the missions of In the Heights was to capture what it was like to be in this area of Washington Heights where he grew up. I grew up 10 blocks from here. If you walk down that hill, uh, you'll hit my house. And what better way than to just hear all the different music being blasted on nearby radios? It's hard for us to get people to turn down the radios. That's what it's like in Washington Heights. There's salsa blasting out of stereos. There's hip hop and reggaeton coming out of people's cars. So we're hearing a bunch of random songs, or are we? In fact, what Lynn is saying about his neighborhood accurately describes what is going on in this opening radio montage. Indeed, we hear salsa, bolero, merengue, pop piano, Spanish language hip hop, and reggaeton. Each of these snippets are not random songs either, but are musical themes that run throughout the show. The salsa is what they dance to in the club, the bolero is heard and discussed in the Rosario family dinner scene, and also sampled in the finale of the show. That chord progression in the merengue returns in Carnival del Barrio. The pop piano becomes the opening riff of It Won't Be Long Now. The hip hop song with its catchphrase No Pare Sigue Sigue is referenced in three other songs, and the reggaeton beat returns memorably in 96,000. So the radio montage is actually a modern take on the overture, combining a traditional aspect of musicals with the hip hop and Latin culture of Washington Heights. The spirit of synthesis in this radio montage can even be heard in the radio DJ announcement in English while the Spanish language hip hop plays underneath. Tomorrow's the 4th of July, but we're kicking off the celebration tonight with fireworks at the marina. Spanish and English occupying the same sonic space is a metaphor not only for the hybrid nature of the neighborhood Washington Heights, but also as a mission statement for Lynn as a composer, representing an idea that is equal parts Latin and American. The Americanness of this is further emphasized by the fact that the announcer is talking about the upcoming celebrations for July 4th, setting up the theme of what it means to be American. When we see our first character come out, we're still hearing this radio channel surfing overture, which has landed on reggaeton, or as indicated in the Broadway score, the umbrella genre, dancehall reggae. So we see this character come out and do some breakdance moves to this music. He's got a boombox, which is sort of the explanation of where this radio channel surfing is coming from, and he's got paint spray cans in each hand. Without knowing anything about this musical, the audience might be tempted to think that the show is going to be all about this person, who almost seems like the embodiment of a barrio stereotype. Instead, what happens is our actual protagonist, Usnavi, emerges from an apartment building and says, Yo, that's my wall! and chases away the first person who we later learn is Graffiti Pete. This trick of giving the audience an expectation and then upending that expectation is an important one because it lets us know to stay on our toes. Lin is literally challenging the audience to go beyond stereotypes. Now there is additional significance to Graffiti Pete, which will be the topic of a future video, so please subscribe and stay tuned. As the reggaeton or dancehall reggae beat fades, we're left with this rhythm. A 3-2 clave rhythm, so named because it's a two-bar phrase with three hits in the first bar and two hits in the second bar, played on traditional hardwood sticks, which is the backbone of many Latin musical styles, including reggaeton and dancehall reggae. It's almost like Lin is exposing the heartbeat of this music, and we know this heartbeat is important to him because it's featured really prominently not just at the top of the stage version of In the Heights, but also in the film trailer and my guess in the film as well. But what Lin wants us to realize goes deeper than that. Many people associate this 3-2 clave rhythm with America, specifically a song called America from the musical West Side Story. Composer Leonard Bernstein uses the 3-2 clave in America's intro, a nod to this Latin heartbeat that some may have overly credited to Leonard Bernstein, including, well, me. He even references the America clave rhythm in his opening number. But about this, Lynn says, The opening clave betrays those who really listen to Latin music and those who only know show tunes. The people who only know show tunes go, What a cool homage to America from West Side Story. No, composer Leonard Bernstein is doing an homage to Latin music. The three and the two is the fundamental building block for many of our rhythms. What I think Lynn is doing here is reclaiming the 3-2 clave and using it as it was 
was intended. See, Leonard Bernstein does use the clave, but then adds in the huero, another Latin American percussion instrument, in a triplet beat. In effect, this triplet obscures the clave rhythm and its characteristic syncopation. Soon the clave is dropped entirely. So what Bernstein is doing in America is referencing the clave. It's decorative. It's just for looks. It's made entirely of gumdrops and licorice. Now that's not a knock on Bernstein. He was a genius composer, musician, and educator whose interest in the clave just wasn't necessarily authentic representation. But what Lin does is use the clave as originally intended, which is as the key rhythm or heartbeat of Afro-Caribbean music. In fact, clave means keystone. That's why Lin introduces the clave by showing us how it underlies dancehall reggae, and then he builds up a new song, his opening number, using the clave as the keystone holding everything together. Notice how when Lin adds the wero to the clave, it accentuates the syncopated rhythm, working with it instead of against it. It's not just decorative, it's functional. If you want to learn more about how West Side Story inspired In the Heights, you can click on this video. But I just want to add that West Side Story is still very much with us. There was a Broadway revival that opened just a month before the pandemic hit, and a Spielberg-directed film version is coming out in December, meaning that it's going to go head-to-head -head with In the Heights for award season. So yeah, it's going to be very interesting. And now with our protagonist in place and the clave rhythm going, we're ready to talk about the first lyric uttered by a character in the show, and it is... Lights up on Washington Heights, up at the break of day, I'll wake up and I got this little punk I gotta chase away. So quick note, I'm using this high school production of In the Heights because Lin often truncated the opening lyric when he did TV appearances. Lights up on Washington Heights, up at the dawning, I wipe down the awning, hey y'all, good morning. And I want the full lyric. But on top of that, this production of The Highland Players from 2018 has pro shot quality, courtesy of videographer JD Hopper, who kindly gave me his blessing. So if you need to see a good In the Heights pro shot, link is in the description. Okay, now back to the show. Lights Up is actually a common stage direction at the beginning of a scene of a play. Since plays take place on a stage, usually they begin with lights going up, indicating that the playwright wants the lights up moment as the first thing that the audience sees. Indeed, Lin likes to throw in these sort of meta stage direction jokes into his lyrics. Enter me, he says in parentheses. The reason why the words enter me are in parentheses is because the standard formatting for stage directions in a script are that they're in parentheses. It's important because in theater, stage directions language is usually spoken by a stage manager. And so Usnavi comes across as a comforting figure, someone who has the role of being in charge of the storytelling. He's so reassuring that the lights do actually come up immediately after he says lights up. Lights up on Washington Heights! Implying he's calling the light cues. I think Lynn is reminding us of another comforting stage manager character from another classic American play. Our Town. Just like Usnavi, the stage manager from Our Town narrates the lives of a small community who begins their day at the break of dawn. Just about dawn. <laughs> yep. Just about. So again, Lights Up firmly situates us in the Broadway tradition. But as Lin continues, we realize Lin isn't just reading a bunch of stage directions, he's actually rhyming and yes, rapping. A song has started. Now a lot of these rhymes are not perfect rhymes, but slant rhymes, meaning they don't have exactly the same rhymed syllables. Take the rhymes break of day and chase away. Now day and away are perfect rhymes, but break and chase rhyme only the vowels, but not the consonants. This is called assonance, and is sometimes frowned upon in the musical theater tradition. The musical theater pl places a very pure emphasis on pure rhyme, um, not rhyming moon with doom. <laughs> Not a real rhyme, but moon with June. Lynn is probably referencing people like Stephen Sondheim, who wrote, In the theater, true rhyme works best on every level. But in establishing rap as a type of expression on Broadway, Lynn needs to also demonstrate to hip-hop fans that hip-hop language can exist on Broadway without being watered down. And part of that is the use of slant rhymes and assonance. I think hip-hop, the reward for the listener, is often the unexpected rhyme. 
it's Biggie rhyming awning with good morning because of the way he says it. 546 in the morning, crack of dawning. Which is in fact one of the first slant rhymes in the show, demonstrating that Usnavi also comes out of the hip hop tradition. So Lin is letting us know that even in this classic American Our Town narrative, he hasn't forgotten to be true to hip hop. But just to put some of those musical theater purists at ease, Lin's next lyric for Usnavi is... I am Usnavi and you probably never heard my name. Of course, my fame are greatly exaggerated, exacerbated by the fact that my syntax is highly complicated because I am a great... Syntax usually refers to the way we order words in a language, but here I think he's using it reflexively as a shorthand for his complex rhyme schemes and assonances. This self-awareness allows Lin some leeway because he connects the slant rhyme to Usnavi's identity as an immigrant with a uniquely hybrid form of self-expression. Again, synthesis. To backtrack, just before those syntax lyrics, we met another character, the piragua guy selling piragua or Puerto Rican shaved ice. He's hawking his flavors, which include common ones like cherry and strawberry, and Spanish language versions of common flavors like parcha or passion fruit, and china or oranges. But he says just for today, he has mame, a fruit that is indigenous to Latin American countries and has no English word equivalent. Lin is representing his roots, and to underline this point, this entire exchange with the Piragua guy is the moment when the Juero actually starts playing and joins the 3-2 clave. And though the Piragua guy isn't one of the main characters, he's important because he underlines one of the themes of the show, which is summed up by Usnavi a little while later in the opening number when he raps. Everybody's got a job, everybody's got a dream. See, Lin wanted to show Latin Americans as entrepreneurs, not gang members. And no one's gonna be a gang member. Let's create a, for me, more realistic world in this neighborhood where you actually see the small business owner and not the guy on the corner. Lin wanted to break out of that stereotypical depiction, which is why he resisted early calls from producers to add in grit. The big deal theater producer says, now I know in your version, Nina's coming home with a secret from her parents. She's lost her scholarship. This doesn't feel high stakes enough. Scholarship, big deal. What if she's pregnant? What if her boyfriend at school hit her? What if she got caught with drugs? There is definitely a phenomenon of BIPOC stories being reduced to stereotypes by producers. The Netflix film 40-year-old version depicts the semi-autobiographical struggles of a black woman playwright, Rada Blank, as her play about Harlem is getting produced at a predominantly white theater. In the film, the producers pressure her into making her Harlem more stereotypical. I just wish you hadn't shied away from darkness. I, I, I mean, if you're gonna call it Harlem Ave, you gotta give me Harlem Ave. I should write in a teen mother shooting up in an alley. The film actually shows what In the Heights might have looked like had it been sold to one of these producers. Avoiding gangster cliches, Lynn makes sure that everyone in In the Heights has a job and has a dream. The Piragua guy is selling shaved ice from a cart. Usnavi has the bodega where he employs his cousin Sonny. Carla and Daniela run the salon where they employ Vanessa. The Rosarios run Rosario's cab company where they employ Benny. Abuela Claudia is retired, but there's even an entire song about how she worked her butt off. Nina, while not working, is actually a student struggling with her finances at Stanford and has very ambitious dreams. In fact, the only person who doesn't have a traditional job is Graffiti Pete, the guy who Usnavi chased away. Now again, I'm going to cover this more in the video on Graffiti Pete, but long story short, Graffiti Pete is a freelance artist whose work Usnavi later learns to appreciate. Now we've already talked about Abuela Claudia, but here she is entering and solving Usnavi's problem of spoiled milk. Try my mother's old recipe! One can of condensed milk! Again, underlying the fact that she's a practical working person. Next, Usnavi returns to his stage manager role and anticipates another concern the Broadway audience might have. You're probably thinking, I'm up Shit's Creek, I've never been north of 96th Street. Now I'm sure people who know New York City know exactly what he's talking about. But in simple terms, Lynn is making a joke about the type of people who typically see Broadway shows. For context, the average household income of the Broadway audience members in 2018 to 2019 was $261,000. 
Meanwhile, a quick look at the incomes of New York City show that median household incomes drop precipitously, almost exactly at 96th Street. So what Usnavi, the stage manager, is saying is that the wealthy Broadway audience watching this show probably avoids going to the poorer neighborhoods of the city. In fact, if you listen to the film version of the song, which was released in advance of the film, the line I've never been north of 96th Street is not said by Usnavi, but by someone else, possibly turning these lyrics into an interaction rather than a direct address. But in the stage show, Usnavi says it playfully to roast the audience, even joking I hope you're writing this down, I'm gonna test you later. This point is even more incisive when you compound this with the fact that the stage is filled with Latin actors who typically don't get cast on Broadway. New York City's Latin American population is 28.6% according to the 2010 census. Yet in the nine Broadway seasons between 2006 and 2015, they were still only cast in 3% of Broadway roles. That's why writing a show like In the Heights was so important to Lynn, to inspire the next generation of Latin American performers, including Usnavi actor Anthony Ramos, who saw the Broadway show when he was a teen. So after semi-roasting the musical theater audience about 96th Street, Lynn plays nice and throws the musical theater crowd another reference. Well, you must take the A-Train. Take the A-Train, which is a 1939 jazz standard by Billy Strayhorn, which became a signature tune of Duke Ellington. And it was a song featured in the Duke Ellington Broadway review, Sophisticated Ladies. And while it's a nod to Broadway and musical tradition, it's also a reference to the actual A-Train, which runs north-south from downtown all the way up to Washington Heights itself. Right before we get to the first chorus of the opening number, Usnavi introduces the audience to the common struggle of rising rents. Our neighbors started packing up and picking up and never since our rent went up, it's got mad expensive, but we live with just enough. Hinting at the phenomenon known as gentrification. Later on in the show, Sonny outright raps about gentrification. You kids are living without a good education, change the station, teach them about gentrification. Lynn knows that representing his community also includes representing its day-to-day concerns. In the Heights, uh, when I wrote the first draft, there was nothing about gentrification. I moved back home after living uh, at Wesleyan and there was a Starbucks on 181st Street. Yeah. The people who make this place special are suddenly not affo- able to afford, afford to live here anymore. That was the reality of my characters. The theme of gentrification pops up again and again throughout the show and he wants to let the audience in on this up front. I think human stories are inherently political. You can't divorce mm-hmm. Um, the the way we're living from the times we're living in. And because Lynn put in the work to synthesize everything into a cohesive vision before mentioning gentrification, I think the audience is now prepared to hear this with an open mind. He depicts Washington Heights as a world where people have jobs and dreams while simultaneously showing that this world coexists with the Broadway tradition and with the music on boomboxes and with the music of the islands all thriving together in harmony. And after a whirlwind three-minute thesis statement, I think Lynn knows that we're all ready to sit back and relax and hear a big chorus. And Washington Heights, that's the only thing from the original version uh, that survives into the present. It was the hook. And that's how Lynn revolutionized Broadway in just three minutes. Thank you for watching the video. I have a whole series of videos on In the Heights planned, so please subscribe. And a special thanks to my new patrons on Patreon, Maxwell Haddad and Changa. And as always, see you in the next video. Peace.